Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 335, Case Study of a Menopausal Female Patient. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the things that we've been trying to do in the last couple of podcasts or health casts is give an opportunity for Dr. Maupin to talk about how she processes new patients that come in. We have started a, a, a sub-program at BioBalance Health where we train other physicians around the country who want to do their practice the way that Dr. Maupin does her practice. And we, as part of the training, when those doctors go home and they get patients, the first few patients that they get, they send all the documentation to Dr. Maupin and say, well, you review this and, and as if it were one of your patients, and would you recommend to us whatever you would recommend to that patient? And so... Th- this data that we're going to be discussing today is a result of one of those episodes. And these are, these are not patients that are identified in any way. None of the descriptors would, would make them uh, visible to anyone. Uh, but what we want to do is to show other physicians and other patients what the process is. Because one of the things that we've talked about in the five years that we've been doing these podcasts is that Dr. Moffin's office is not meant to be a mass production facility. She doesn't just sell hormones, testosterone, y'all stop by and get some. She only <laughs> gives them to people that have an identified need, that have a medical need, that ha- are not uh, impeded by other medical issues that she can identify and refer for appropriate treatment. I mean, she does this in a very clinically appropriate way. And so we thought we would model that for you in a discussion where we go through an analysis of a, a sample female patient. In the previous podcasts that we did, we did a male patient. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're going to be looking at the history of a 60-year-old Caucasian female who's menopausal. In addition to the questions asked in the comprehensive hormone history, one of her greatest issues is staying focused and the ability to do multitasking. Uh, so, and, and this is related to... Those are her symptoms. Yeah, symptoms. Uh, testosterone deficiency syndrome yes. is what mm-hmm. you call it. Also, she's currently being managed with an oral BHRT. Now, what That's is that? bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. But what that means is bioidentical estradiol, bioidentical progesterone, right. not testosterone. Okay. Because testosterone would be BH... BHRT... T. T. Yeah. And... A lot of doctors historically have done bioidentical replacement of estrogen. Mm -hmm. They're less knowledgeable or or more reluctant uh, to do the testosterone for females in particular. Mm -hmm. It's not really historically known as a female concern. Even though there's lots of research everywhere, there's not a lot of research that's published in the American College of OBGYN journals. That's sometimes the only journal an OBGYN will read. And because they don't put much about they put nothing about bioidentical hormones except to say they're terrible for no apparent reason. And then, but they, but they also don't put anything in about testosterone and why it's important and the role that it plays in women. So if you're an OBGYN and you're busy and you're exhausted and you're sleep deprived, which I've walked that walk, right. it's really hard to read more to than one journal. Home. Yeah. So you're reading the Bible, every, what they call the Bible of OBGYN. Right every month when it comes in and you feel like you're educated, well, this isn't in there. The last thing they said to us was don't give estrogen in 2001. When the WHI came out, they never said, oh, by the way, you could give estrogen. It might help. (laughs) And and those outdated or even erroneous studies never disappear from the internet. They're still being quoted. They're still out there. Uh, Just this week in a major Midwestern newspaper, the People's Pharmacy section had uh, an article in response to someone writing in about bioidentical hormone replacement, and they quoted the Women's Health Initiative and said, oh, it's a dangerous thing. Uh, you could get a heart uh, attack or, or a stroke, and you should stay away from it. And that's all 
that was outmoded 15 years ago. It wasn't true. It, it wasn't true in the first place. And to begin with, and then all the research that has come out that followed the WHI study, which got a lot of press, the rest of the research that has come out following that, um, negating the, the results right. or saying it was a terrible study so it didn't really mean anything, ha they've all come out and it's all been downplayed, right. quiet. Right. So it's really hard for somebody who is either a really active, really tired uh, OBGYN or family doctor or, and patients who are busy doing their lives to know what's right. When they come out and they, they quote a study from 2000 or 2001, WHI, they're doing everybody a disservice because right. they haven't read all of the retractions since. And they don't know that they're doing that. I True. Mean, I mean, they believe... The devil they're due. They don't know. They haven't kept up. So when someone says there's no research, that means they haven't looked. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <clears throat> so then uh, in the summary, uh, this particular patient still has her uterus and her ovaries. She's prone to acne, and so she's getting 50 milligrams of spironolactone. And I've used that since 1986 with my teenage patients then who had acne. And it was it's a diuretic that's not used for diuresis much anymore. Uh, but we use it because the happy outcome is in women, it stops acne. So it, it works at the skin level and decreases acne. We don't use it in men because it can cause man breasts. So we don't, we don't, we use it in very low doses in men with heart failure, but we oh, don't okay. use it very much in, in men who uh, just need a diuretic. We use something else. Okay. You use a this, different diuretic. Yes. Mm -hmm. If they need it for, for blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't usually use spironolactone. However, this is a happy side effect that we found serendipitously and has been, has been studied and written about. And we now know that this medication is very low risk, but still stops acne, unlike many of the other medications. It's also cheap. Okay. So, so that was the summary. Mm -hmm. uh, then you got a, a, a checklist of, from the new patient questionnaire mm -hmm. of different symptoms. Right. And then you got lab tests. Yes. So let's go through the checklist mm -hmm. of symptoms first. Okay. And, and so as you start to look at this, you're beginning to formulate an opinion. Yes. Uh, so here are the symptoms of hormonal deficiencies that she checks. She has a disc, decreased or absent sex drive, no libido. That's all testosterone. Nothing else affects libido besides, besides psychological things. Psychological things. But sure. no other yeah. hormone affects uh, performance demands in particular. Yeah, yeah that's right. And stress. Uh, fatigue and lack of energy. Change in mood, anxiety, depression, insomnia, declining mental ability and memory. Feeling hopeless and no motivation, which goes with depression. Diminished strength and exercise tolerance, joint aches and arthritic symptoms, hot flashes and night sweats. That's where we divide between the testosterone symptoms. And now the hot flashes generally are not from testosterone, although I've known people that have hot flashes from low testosterone. Now we get in at the hot flash part. That's the estrogen symptoms. Which is why symptoms. she's taking estradiol and progesterone? Yes. So she's get, she has hot flashes, so she takes... Uh, bioidentical estrogen, I think orally, I, that's what it assumed. So she's taking that orally. And then she also has dry and wrinkled skin, mm -hmm. which also can be low estrogen, low testosterone, and low thyroid. But I mean, so they're that all... Be multiple hormones. Right. You have to, so then you go to the labs to identify wh where that is. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then a lot of... She's subject to frequent bladder infect infections. That's from low estrogen. Low estro when you have low estrogen, your uh, women's bottoms get uh, very atrophic or thin. And so that also goes for the bladder. So the bladder gets irritable mm -hmm. and um, it is not as protected from bacteria. So bacteria can go up through the urethra without being blocked by mucus and uh, thick, a thick epithelial lining. So you got lots more. And no filter to protect it then. Right. No, you get a lot more infections and a lot more irritable bladder like urine loss. Mm -hmm. So that's something that goes away in general with estrogen treatment. And she still has it, obviously. And then under general medical conditions or history, she says depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. which we sort of already determined mm -hmm. from the symptoms mm -hmm. she reported. Arthritis and thyroid disease, uh, hypo, not hyper. So she has a low thyroid and she's taking Synthroid. So we have an ability to look at her lab work after this to see if the thyroid is adequate because sometimes her fatigue can be from thyroid as well, low thyroid. So maybe she is not an adequate thyroid level. So mm -hmm. those are the things that I'm thinking about when I'm looking at her symptoms. Then under uh, 
Sexual history, she marks three or four, but mm -hmm. most of them simply give reference to the fact that she is functional, uh, her equipment works, but that she doesn't have any desire. Right, okay. So, uh, and then she says she's menopausal, she's completed her family, she is married, uh, she tries to eat a balanced diet three times a day, and she doesn't eat wheat products. She's, uh, she doesn't say she's gluten intolerant, but she says she stays away from it anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's very common nowadays. Everybody's kind of testing to see whether they have um, an intolerance to gluten. Gluten's in many things besides just wheat so uh, or bread. So we used to do the allergy tests by taking people off every food and just giving them blueberry muffins, which is so funny because the muffins had gluten in them, and then adding things to that diet to see when they got their symptoms of allergy. Mm -hmm. But we gave them gluten. I mean, those are the old days. We didn't really even think about gluten as being something that someone would be allergic to or couldn't process mm -hmm. in their intestines. And maybe we didn't have as much of it then. But that's how we used to do it. Now, we take things away. We go through a diet with no gluten to see if somebody feels better, or if their intestines work better, or they stop having symptoms of allergic symptoms or uh, just fatigue. Well, and then you were correct in your assumption. She's only had oral hormone interventions. Right. So, she's so had I asked buccal that. tablets and oral pills. So, so buc I call buckle. them buckle, but some people say buccal. So, they're, well, if they're from the south, they do. yes, I know. Yeah, you guys. Anyway, um, they, that means it's in the cheek. You mm -hmm. you literally suck on it, and it goes directly, supposedly directly into your bloodstream. Some of it gets into your stomach as well. So some is going directly into your bloodstream. Some is swallowed so you, so you can destroy it with stomach acid mm -hmm. like any other mm -hmm. um, hormone or medication in the stomach. So you probably just hold it in your cheek and not swallow until right. it dissolves. Right. And that's the idea. It's, it's, it's not a bad – I mean, actually, when we didn't have pellets, mm -hmm. I mean, buckle was a, a good way to get estrogen and progesterone. It's just not a very good way to get testosterone. It doesn't absorb very well. Okay. So it was – for us – before we knew about testosterone in the olden days, that was a good way to give somebody estrogen and and uh, progesterone mm -hmm. because it did absorb and gave us a blood level. But at that time, I didn't know what the normal blood levels were supposed to be. Well, if I got anything, I was happy. Right. So, th so let's talk about blood levels. So, mm -hmm. so you look at this checklist of symptoms and medical history, family history, mm -hmm. social history, all the things that you ask about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you pull up, what is it, 12 different lab panels that you want? Yeah, typically. 17. 17. So. And, and you start to look at the data for that. And so mm -hmm. the first one that you want to look at is how much free testosterone do they have? So the ovary makes testosterone in mm -hmm. women. And uh, we make less and less as we get older. And that begins to wane after we turn 40. But we hit a critical level at something, an individual level that's critical for us mm -hmm. as we as we decrease our, or as our age goes up, our testosterone goes down, and then we feel it at different levels. So we, right. there is no perfect level for every woman right. of testosterone. But in general, we look to young women's testosterone, and we find that young women have uh, a total testosterone of over 30. Mm -hmm. that's, that's young, healthy women, not on birth control pills, not on any other hormones cycling women. And then we find that young women have a free testosterone of seven or more. And then we compare aging women to that young women's hormone level. So that's called a T-score. That's what, that's what we call it in evaluating bones and other things. The average or normal range for young, healthy women is a T-score. So we're comparing this blood test to young, healthy women. And she, instead of having a, se a seven, she has a 0. 0.5, 0. Yeah. 0.5 or 0. 0.2? 0. 0.2. 0. 0.2. Yeah. So she has literally almost no testosterone. Free testosterone is the only part you feel. It's the only part that actually does something for mm -hmm. you. So the rest is just storage and invisible. So free testosterone is so low we can barely measure it. And part of that is she doesn't make a lot. The second part is the more estrogen you take, the more you bind up your testosterone. So she's, she's doing so her testosterone level a disservice by taking the estrogen and the progesterone. So the analogy that we use for that is like a big city cab system. And your testosterone has to go out and catch a cab to go to the location where it needs to be delivered. And all of the cabs are full. Those are the testosterone. Those are the, the ones that are bound. Bound up. The free testosterone 
means that that particular cab is empty and testosterone can grab a hold of it and go where it needs to go. Mm-hmm. But all the others, it has to wait for it to go by because they're already blocked mm-hmm. and, can, and it can't access that particular cab. So she, her free testosterone is just 0. 0.2 and it needs to be seven, seven. or more. Mm-hmm. And so she's got to get some. So if you give her testosterone as a replacement, and particularly if you do it with pellets mm-hmm. in the hip, then it creates a reservoir within the body for an on-demand system. So whenever you need to call a cab, there's one available, mm-hmm. and it'll come pick up the free testosterone and take it where it needs to go. One of the reasons that pellets are much more reliable than oral, buckle, creams, all of those go up <laughs> right. and Rush come, hour traffic. Yeah, go up and come down every day. You get a really high level and then a really low level mm-hmm. a certain number of hours after you take it. And some have to be taken two and three times a day mm-hmm. or applied two or three times a day. Therefore, you're up and down all day. The pellet goes up and then stays pretty much at a plateau and slowly comes down when mm-hmm. it's over. So you always have this same level of testosterone or estrogen, whichever you're taking or both, from the pellets. That's the advantage of the pellets. That's why I do them is so that you can feel, we can all feel normal. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what our body does. Mm -hmm. If we need more and we're exercising, we take more from the pellets. Right. And you can calculate a dose to give them a given period of time where they're going to stay consistent. And you both know when that is so they can Mm -hmm. schedule when to come in and get. Right. A certain size of pellet, like a hundred milligram testosterone pellet and a 25 milligram estrogen pellet last about four months. So in, unless they have an unusual metabolism, we basically say come back in three and a half at first just in case to find that we, out. we underestimated. Mm-hmm. We don't want you to go back to square one. We want you to just come down a little bit before we redose. Mm-hmm. So then we redraw blood. We look to see what the levels came out with at the lowest point, mm-hmm. And that tells us whether we need to change the dose or change the timing. So that's, that's our tweaking visit. And mm-hmm. it's three and a half months in women after the pellets are first place. Okay. And we place them, we place different or the same pellets, depends on what we find in the patient at that visit. So after looking at her testosterone and making a recommendation or decision about mm-hmm. how much to give her if, if she needs mm-hmm. it, then you look at her TSH and her particular TSH is 1.53. Her TSH manages her thyroid. So I'm going to jump to FSH and LH. All right. FSH is a hormone that it's, it's kind of like my, my check system. If you have enough estrogen and either you're not menopausal or you have enough estrogen with your replacement, your FSH, the hormone from your brain, your pituitary that stimulates the ovary and makes that ovary spit out estrogen. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, if you're, if you're making enough, it should be less than 23. Your FSH should be less than 23. Hers is 97. So she isn't making enough and she's not absorbing enough to go back to her brain and shut that system down. FSH is, it, the searches of that at night are what causes hot flashes and makes you makes you miserable or have anxiety attacks. So having a high FSH isn't really good for you. It's also pummeling the ovary that's not responding with stimulation and it's not happening. So... So would that contribute to her anxiety and her yes. feeling of being out of focus? Yes. It, it affects the anxiety. The lack of focus is a little different. Mm-hmm. That has to do with testosterone levels. And and when you have a low testosterone level, your blood supply to the, air, the problem-solving areas and the areas of short-term memory, they, they basically divert the blood flow away from those areas. And when you get your testosterone back, it goes back. So it takes some time. Right. To get your brain back, and if you haven't, if your brain's been underperforming for for six or eight years, mm. then it's going to take a while, over a year, to come back completely. If it's only underperforming for a year, then you may you'll be probably get it back in four to five months. So it depends on how long you've had that blood flow not going to those areas of the brain. So her FSH was ninety seven. Her LH is forty four point seven. So LH should be under 10 oh, wow. in cycling women who, um, who have plenty of testosterone. And that's luteinizing hormone. Yes, it is. And LH stimulates the ovary to make testosterone, but it also stimulates ovulation. Now, this doctor asked me a question. He said, now, I'm, this woman's taking progesterone, mm-hmm. so 
why isn't her LH turned off and gone, and why didn't it go down to less than 10? Well, that's because LH responds more to testosterone in both men and women than it does to progesterone. Okay. So you can have a lot of progesterone. Your LH is still going to be high, and you'll still have hot flashes or anxiety attacks. All right. So we have to treat you with testosterone to make that come down. And well, that's how I know you have enough. Her progesterone is at 5.0. So yeah, and that's that? adequate progesterone. Progesterone should be 2.5. 215, but okay. that's adequate. It should be able, if that was really the hormone that turned off LH, mm -hmm. then it then should it have, it should be shut down to below 10. Mm -hmm. But clearly this is a great example of how it's not the hormone that shuts down LH. Okay. So her estradiol is 19. So a young, healthy woman, again, we're comparing this woman who's 60 to a young, healthy woman, 20, 20 to 40, like we compare the bones of a 60 year old to a 29 year old. We're looking at young healthy as being the norm. So you should have an estradiol level of 60 to 250. Our hormones go up and down all month, but that's the range they're in okay. if we're not on the pill. So help me understand because you, uh, there's a lot of data. We've done a lot of conversations about normal lab tests, normal ranges, what's normal for young women or mm -hmm. old women or what have you, and, and the problems with determining that. So when you are training physicians, one of the things that you have to talk to them about is forgetting whatever conversations they've heard about normal lab ranges mm -hmm. and paying attention to symptom reduction. So the mm -hmm. doses that you recommend may surprise some of them mm -hmm. uh, because it, it will be higher than the, quote, normally thought adequate amount. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the importance here isn't the number per se. It is the symptom reduction. Is that correct? Am That's I correct. I, but I do want to see the LH come down. The, the, um, the hormones that respond to the hormone I'm giving, mm -hmm. I want to see that tells me that it's actually getting to where I want it. So I do want to see those suppressed, mm -hmm. but the level of testosterone Oftentimes, my patients will go to their doctor and, and they will have the total testosterone, which is really a moot point. It really doesn't, it's not doing anything. And the free testosterone listed and they'll go, oh my gosh, that's such a high testosterone level. You know, you, you, you're you going to be a man, which is ridiculous, you know, but having said that, that's their doctor. Their doctor is just stating what he knows about men and testosterone levels, I think or just making a statement because they're not used to looking at testosterone levels. There's been many studies with testosterone pellets mm -hmm. that show that it's not the number compared to the rest of the population of blood level of testosterone. It is the re resolution of the symptoms. And we gave you that like the first seven symptoms right. are from low testosterone. So when those resolve, that's when you stop increasing the dose. That's how most people on pellets should be managed, not by looking at a number that is adequate and then we stop right. if you're still sick. We hit a goal. We well, hit a goal. Yeah. We're done. You, you don't get any more. So that's all we need to worry about. Right. So, the, so we're listening to our patients and looking at the number. What the number does give us is something we had before and now we have afterwards. And so that shows us where the patient needs to be, where she's happy, where she feels good, and where she started from. Mm -hmm. So those two numbers matter. It's an individual normal. So some of these things, if you go through the checklist of symptoms that she identified, some of those things in my experience of, of doing family counseling, mm -hmm. three, four months later, people have trouble remembering what it felt like. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the improvement is incremental uh, over time. It's not a radical, like you take an aspirin and 20 minutes later, your headache's gone mm -hmm. and you know it. Uh, so this is like weeks and weeks later and they come in and say, well, how's your depression? Well, what, what depression? depression? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So what do you teach That's the same ways with, about that? You have mean, to, how do they count? On the second that? visit, when I talk to patients uh -huh. and I say, well, so how do you feel? Sometimes they're like, Oh my God, I've got my life back. I feel wonderful. I'm perfect. I don't, right. you know, but they don't remember their symptoms. So I right. go through the symptoms. I say is you review that with them. Yes. This all the symptoms are. they gave me in the very beginning, right. here are the symptoms. They go, did I really write that? You know, they don't remember they had joint pain. You also take or, a photograph when they yeah, first come in. I do. And, and then I can them. see the difference and show them the difference. And oh my gosh, yeah. sometimes it doesn't, it looks like 
so I'm, they differ. I'm seeing the daughter or younger sister of the person that I interviewed four yeah. months before. It's, it's it really amazing is amazing how this how works. How much physiologically you improve when depression and anxiety recede. Uh, when your skin when tone's exhausted, good, when, your skin tone's when you've good, had great sex, is good. Yeah. it all works great. <laughs> yeah, when you've had great sex. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's one more lab that's mentioned here. <laughs> yes. Uh, MCH, I don't know what that is. MCH is the size of, of your um, red cell. And if the red cells are large, sometimes that means that you have a B12 deficiency. Okay. So hers were on the large end. Mm -hmm. And that is that means she needs some B12. Oh, okay. And usually B12 is an interesting vitamin. It, 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 it is in all of the uh, neurologic functions in your body, your brain, your peripheral nerves, every, the, the nerves that go to your muscles, the nerves that give you emotion, Every one of your nerves needs B12. So if you are low on B12, then either you aren't eating meat or you're an alcoholic, mm -hmm. drinking alcohol because that uses up all your B12, or your, um, your stomach has stopped making a hormone called intrinsic factor, and so you can't absorb B12 from your food. So that is, that's the story on B12. So if you're, if you're red cells, I don't have to order a B12 test. If the red cells are really big, then, you know, I start with B12. And then if they're still big after the B12 level is good, mm -hmm. then I, then there are some other things that can cause that. And then I send these patients to hematologists. I would guess that she has, she just has B12 deficiency. Okay. So you give her B12 right. and see. Mm -hmm. So in summary, when you attempt to become a new patient and you go to the website, biobalancehealth.com, and you download the new patient package and you fill out all the stuff, this and you send it in. You get your blood tests and you send them in. This is the process that Dr. Moffin goes through before you come. And then when you come, she sits down with you and does exactly what she's done here. She goes through every one of these things and says, this is what I think. This is what I see. This is what I know. This is how it works. This is what we want to do for you. So then you get your pellets. And you come back in three and a half months and she sits down with you again, gets a blood test before you come back and she goes through it again. And she says, how about your symptoms? Has this gone away? Is this a problem? Is there anything new? What, what's going on? Then you typically don't see her again for several more visits. You'll see the nurse practitioners. You just come in. It takes 20 minutes to get your pellets inserted and you go home. And there isn't a need for a doctor's appointment or a doctor's review. The mm -hmm. nurses and nurse practitioners review all the data. If they see anything, then they review that with Dr. Moffin. If Dr. Moffin is concerned, then someone will contact you and say, you know what, we need to have a, a conference. Come in. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if there's no contact, there's no concern, everything's working fine. And that's the way you want it to be. So if you go to a physician who has been adequately trained and knows how to manage hormones, is a hormone specialist, uh, you will likely be treated this way. If you go somewhere else and you're not treated this way, then you may want to think about where you're going. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.